Collegeville, Minnesota is a map dot, so named naturally by its identity. An educational institution. It's green, miles of trees and lakes and fields full of corn and soybeans and hay. It feels authentic with a neighbor to the west named Farmer and a neighbor to the south called Cold Spring. And it's quiet too. This campus, 2,700 acres, that looks like America looks when we reminisce about our country's roots. Untouched. We were at Notre Dame week one, we were at Michigan week two, and when you go visit those campuses, you really get an idea of what it's like to play Division One FBS football. You're talking about some of the best facilities, some of the best training staff. It's really a luxury on that level of football. Uh, yeah, here at Division Three St. John's, the love for the game, the passion remains the same. The perks are a little bit different. There are no athletic scholarships here, but there's plenty of perseverance. Marty Smith is spending the day in the life of one Johnny football player, the linebacker on the field, and juggling everything off of it. Thanks, guys. St. John's is the epitome of Division III athletics. Student athletes who operate in that order. Student, then athlete. And if you want to play football here, you play football. The 2015 roster includes 212 players. We took the opportunity this week to follow one of those young men around to see what a day is like in the life of a D3 athlete. And this young man's story is quite unique. In a world where FBS schools are debating how many thousand dollars more per year per diem rate should be for athletes, St. John's linebacker Drake Matuska is at his work-study job, the Midnight Security Shift, at the College of St. Benedict's in Rural, Minnesota. 16 hours ago, the day began right here in the barely off-campus apartment. Matuska shares with five other guys. We're here in the early hours of the morning. You got a long day ahead. Yeah. What, what all do you have to do today? Uh, today, you know, just obviously get to class and I have lifting and film in the afternoon along with my uh, job as a TA and then later this night I also have to go and work security as my second job. There's a lot of 3 a.m. nights going into 6 a.m. lifting so it's the balance between being an athlete and being a committed student. It's a lot of work but he's, he's doing it well. At 9.10, Matuska, a pre-med major, begins the short walk to class. What's that challenge like every day to manage your schedule? Uh, I mean, it's just making sure you're organized. I think that's the biggest thing. But, I mean, you just find time in between, get the homework done that you need to. What made you decide you wanted to be a doctor? What kind of doctor do you want to be? I actually want to be a family physician. I think that's been my goal since day one, doing everything I can to make sure I reach it. Upon arrival, he spends 90 minutes learning something called physiological psychology. All right, so you're an athlete here. Mm -hmm. Describe the St. John-St. Thomas football rivalry for me from a student's perspective who plays another sport. Um, well, it's probably the best day of the year. <laughs> it's yeah. the best day of the year. Why? Because there's, uh, everyone's super into it and we kind of hate each other, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's good to hate each other sometimes. Right, right. For the next 13 hours, Matuska ping-pongs all over campus, bouncing back and forth between academic and athletic responsibilities. Lunch work out, great papers in his role as a teaching assistant, watch game film on St. Thomas, practice, and attend a pep rally. As we were having lunch, you told me that you didn't get to play in this game last year. Mm -hmm. What was it like to have to sit out and watch that game, and how much more important is it this time around, your last time around, because you didn't get to do it last year? I mean, not going to lie, I was, I was bummed that I didn't get to play, but, I mean, it was a team win. I mean, still celebrated, loved it just as everyone else does, but for me, just that or coming this year, my senior year, get one last shot at our, you know, arch rivals. Quick question. Who's going to win on Saturday? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So this crowd passionate about their football team, and that's been displayed uh, throughout the better part of the week. The sports center has descended upon Collegeville, Minnesota. Big crowds there. They're having fun. Visits Philadelphia today. That could affect the outcome here. Tommies are two and six against the Johnnies when a pope named John or Benedict visits the U.S. Zero and one when a pope of another name travels here. St. Thomas has a campus in Rome. The Tommies played an exhibition in Italy last June. Here in Collegeville, they're singing the praises of a great college rivalry. Oh,
priorities and John Gillardi had that and by the time he was finished he also had monumental numbers but after 60 seasons coaching he's not exactly done just yet he still keeps an office here just two doors down from the current head coach who he spends Monday mornings with reviewing film he took a look back at some of his favorite memories with me You spent 60 seasons coaching here. What is it about this place that made you want to stay for so long? Well, look around. How could you beat a place like this? No traffic, uh, <laughs> no commercialization, you know, and next to Mayberry, this is the uh, next place like that. And you still have an office here well, they next have... to the coach, so do you meander down the hall and tell them what you think? They have, I don't never tell them what I think. <laughs> You know, kind of stay out of the way. This might be the most crucial question I ask you. How important is a win against the Tommy Saturday? Oh, that's very important. <laughs> this office is packed with really cool memories. I see you with the president. The Vikings commemorated you being the winningest coach in all of college football. What does that mean to you? Well, it means a lot of hard-fought wins. I owe a lot to... A lot of great ball players look like I know what I was doing. You know, it's just so many of these guys have gone on to be great successes in, in many fields. They went one while they were here, and they won, keep winning. And you're still working because you teach a class here. Yeah. What's the class you teach? Because I'm told it's the most popular class on campus. Well, probably the easiest class on campus. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> the what is it called? Well, it, it's called... Uh, it started to be called theory of coaching 
and we never change the name, but we don't spend a lot of time on, on football. It's, it's really a leadership, how to win at anything. That's what we should call it, see? I want to ask you about your list of no's, because I was nervous when I met you, because I read I, I couldn't call you coach, and that's what I naturally want to call you, that you didn't let anyone call you coach. They had to call you John. Well, when I started coaching here, I was 26 years old. It was a little hard for me to ask some of these guys who were as old as I was, some of the veterans, and, and to insist on being called uh, coach. I don't know. I just don't ask me why. I don't even know why I did most of the things I did. <laughs> Those principles have stuck around this list of no's, which so many of us look at it and think this is crazy. There was no wind sprints, no tackling in practice, no playbooks. I think for a lot of players, they, they look at this list and say, this sounds awesome. What about no no sprints? Because that would have got me recruited well, if I heard that. No sprints because they did so much sprinting during the practice. You know, every time they'd go out for a pass or whatever they did, it was a big long sprint and they kept it up for only practice an hour and a half. We did these things that didn't make much sense to me, but probably everybody else thought we were crazy. But I put it all down in a book here and I wrote this book saying everything that I know about football I wrote here and uh, I can speed read this right yeah please show them how you speed read these the, everything I know about coaching I think you're selling yourself short that's right no, but it's a it's a quick read yes uh, you know what I think you could teach some people some lessons with this thing <laughs> well I don't know Those are some words to live by. The current head coach, Coach Foshing, told me that when he took over the team, he was asked if he wanted to teach that coaching class that Gillardy teaches. He said, you better check with Coach Gillardy and see if he wants to keep teaching it. And at 88 years old, he certainly does. If you like ending with food, all right? So to my left, screen right, the world famous Johnny Bread. You gotta have some Johnny Bread when you're here at St. Thomas. I'm gonna make myself a slice of the good stuff. And Sarah, what do you have over there? And over here, I'm told that Coach Caruso's wife, Rachel, was oh, kind man. enough to cook for us this morning. This is called a hot dish. Yeah. It's a hot dish. It smells amazing. I was trying not to eat while Trevor was talking. It has been an unbelievable scene here. In Try it. Take Women's a bite. I didn't, I didn't Take a bite. I am pretty sure there's zero calories. Wait, what, what am I pouring on this? What is that? Honey? Yes. Honey? All right. I'm going to take the whole plate. Oh, my God. Johnny Bread, baby. This is the good. I'm going to put this on everything. I'm going to put it on meat. I'm going <laughs> to peanut butter. I'm going to... Put it on tuna, Johnny Bread, for that, St. John's win.